All he could use a 3D printer at home for is to make useless trinkets, said the haters. I've had a 3D printer in my home for over 10 years now, and they're useful for a ton of different things. But in my experience, the thing they're most useful for is something that's rarely discussed, sticking things to other things. Let me explain. I like synthesizers, and I have here the Behringer Pro 1, and I want to attach it to my synthesizer setup. Now, normally, if you want to attach something to something else, you have two options. One, you go and buy something, usually from the manufacturer, that's been specifically made to attach your thing to the thing you're trying to attach it to. Now, if you're lucky, it might be the same ecosystem or the same brand, but that's rarely the case. For example, here, I have this keyboard stand from some completely different manufacturer with synthesizers from the 80s, and now I want to attach this synthesizer module made recently from a different brand. So the second option is to make it yourself, but not everyone has the skills to use hand tools to make a custom bracket or mount with precise holes and mounting points to join two things together. And also, not many people have access to a workshop environment anymore to use these tools to make these things. And that's where 3D printing perfectly bridges the gap. These machines can be had for as little as $200 or less, and they can be used to make strong, durable, reliable systems to join things to other things. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how I solved my first world problem with my synthesizers, and how you can use the power of 3D printing to join anything to anything else. Let's get started. Okay, to join anything to anything else, you'll need a few things. To start with, you'll need measuring devices. So here I have a pair of calipers and a ruler. We'll need these to extract measurements from the two things we're joining together to then use to create a bracket. Secondly, you'll need some sort of CAD software, which is your 3D modeling software. I'll be using Fusion 360 in this video, but there is lots of other free options available. You can use, for example, Tinkercad online. It's very basic but there's a free plan and it runs on the cloud, or you can use FreeCAD, which is completely free and open source. This isn't a tutorial on using CAD software, it's just to show you how you can use it to make your part. And then finally, you'll need a 3D printer. Now, yes, I know not everyone has access to a 3D printer, but this is Make Is Muse. Here it's my aim to empower your creativity through technology. And I have a huge list of videos of 3D printers I've reviewed, and they start at less than $200 US. So believe it or not, there's actually a bit of a philosophy to joining something to something else. And this is where you need a bit of design intuition, and it gets easier over time figuring out how to mount something to something that exists. So to start with, with the object you want to mount to something else, you wanna look for areas you might be able to join it to your mount with bolt holes. For example, with this uh, synth module, there's some screws on the side here. Now I know that these are actually just holding on this, this decorative wooden panel, but for your thing, they might actually be structural. In that case, you might be able to remove just two of them and then replace them with slightly longer ones that go through your mount, stuff like that. The alternative to using bolt holes to hold on your mount is to actually clamp to something. Now, for example, with my keyboard stand, I can't screw into it. I don't want to screw into it, but it has these big fat tubes that run across the arms where I can actually create a clamping system that clamps around those tubes to hold it in place. But before you do anything in 3D modeling software, you should grab a pen and a piece of paper and start sketching out your idea. Alrighty, I've gone around and grabbed my dimensions. Now it turns out taking the sidewall off this module actually reveals all the electronics and stuff, but thankfully there's a wood piece and a metal piece. And this metal piece can just go back on to cover that up. So I can use the existing screws as long as I make sure the plastic part I'm replacing the wood piece with is the same thickness. So that actually works out quite well. And this is what I've come up with after going around and grabbing my dimensions. Now you don't have to be a professional draftsman to do this. The whole point is to go around, measure things accurately, mark them down, and then figure out kind of what you want to do before you go into 3D modeling. Because it's so easy to mess up in 3D modeling and you don't want to have to be going back and forth, back and forth. This is your guide to creating a very good 3D model then you can then 3D print and hopefully it works first time. Usually it takes two goes, but we'll see if we get lucky. And in measuring the points on the keyboard stand, I realized if I wanted to slide this mount into place, I'd have to disassemble it, which I really don't want to do. So I've actually sort of started looking at the idea of a clamp that is a two piece design that will come into position. But before we move on, I want to show you just two tips for measuring hole positions like these. Now I talk about this sort of thing in my latest ebook, the ultimate guide to 3D printing tips and tricks. There is a design section in that book. But for example, we have these two holes here. How do you accurately measure their distance apart? Well, we can measure how large they are, 3.4, and this is 3.4 as well. So they're both the same size and that's good. Cause what we can do is we can hit zero on our calipers and then we can use the calipers to measure between both of them, 
like so. And that's the distance between each center point of our bores, which is a really, really handy trick. And then finally, there's triangulation of hole positions. So we can use that trick to figure out where these holes are in relation to each other by measuring the distance between one hole and then distance between another one and then back to that original hole. So you've got a triangle that's formed with that. And because of triangulation, we can figure out the positions of each hole perfectly in relation to each other. And you can use those measurements in your CAD software. Instead of awkwardly trying to measure, oh, it's this far across and this far down, you'll never be accurate like that. But if you measure between each, each direct point and then you have two to reference to, you'll get a really good accurate result. So that's Fire Up CAD. So this first sketch is essentially just a copy of all the dimensions I pulled from the synthesizer module and from the tube on the keyboard stand. So if I zoom in here, you can see I've got this tube at the top and that's labeled at 38 millimeters in diameter. And then I've got these little holes here that are gonna hold the synth module and each of these holes has a distance to another one and they're triangulated. So like I said before, that lets us figure out their position really accurately without having to worry about, oh, what's their X and Y position in space. I can just measure between each point using the technique with the calipers I mentioned. And I know that this hole is 88.68, this hole's 56.7, and this one at the bottom is 117.5. Uh, and that way I know that the holes in the synth module will perfectly go through the holes in my mount and I'll be able to hold it securely in place. Now, a few other things are added to this. I've done a eight millimeter offset from these holes using what's called a construction line. So if I hit X on the keyboard, you can see it turns from a solid to a dashed line. A dashed line or a construction line isn't used in the final geometry. It's just used to construct your sketch. And I've done that to offset the walls of my model from these holes by eight millimeters. Another really important dimension is this eight millimeter dimension here because I want the top of the synth module to clear the top of this offset that will mount onto the tube on the keyboard stand. That's a six millimeter offset. So it's going to give us a six millimeter thick wall that will clamp onto that tube and that's finished and then it creates this shape so that'll hold the synth module fine but it's not going to clamp to the keyboard stand which is where the next extrude comes into play so you might be wondering where's the sketch for this well it's the same sketch you can actually reuse sketches in fusion no problem if i turn it back on here you can see that for this extrude it's used this outline from the sketch and for this one, it's used these outlines. I just extruded them different amounts. So the first one is extruded six millimeters to match the original wooden plate on the side of the synth module. And this one, I extruded 40 millimeters. So that's gonna give us a nice amount of purchase on that tube. But remember, I don't wanna to have to disassemble the entire keyboard stand to slide this into place. So I want to make a clamping detail that will let me separate this top part into two halves that will clamp around that tube. And I could just use two screws on both halves to clamp it together. But I came up with this tricky idea that lets me just use one screw and a detail in the 3D print to lock everything together. So let me show you how that works. First things first, we have this tab with the screw and nut that will hold things together. And I've got the hole here for the screw. And the bottom here, you can see I've got this cut out for the nut. And I just measured it and gave it a 0.2 millimeter clearance to make sure that it's snug, but won't be too hard to insert. And then I created this sketch. So this line is going to be how we cut this part into two. And I've got a nice clean cut here for the tab with the bolt. But then at the other side here, I've got this detail. And the idea is that you insert the top part into that little uh, divot, and then you screw it into place, and it can't come free because it can't lift up out of the part once it's assembled. And to use this sketch to cut the part into two, we turn it into an extruded surface like this. So this surface, has that detail and then wherever it intersects with the part, it will cut it and we can cut the part with a split body like so. And then we have two separate parts, as simple as that. And from here, I did a few things to add clearance, strength and add a little bit of flair to the design. I've got this pocketing detail here. That's just another sketch that's extruded. That's not necessary, but something that I do highly recommend for 3D printing accuracy is this detail here. So you see, where I had my cut, these little edges are now rounded where they go into a in internal corner. And that's because when you're 3D printing with FDM processors, the edge corner will not be perfectly sharp. It's slightly rounded because of that filament extrusion through the 0.4 usually nozzle. And I found by doing this, along with a small clearance, this is like a 0.2 millimeter clearance, I found that doing that actually greatly improves part accuracy in terms of fitting together. Something that also gives us a little bit of wiggle room is this chamfer here. So if you look at the bottom, 
I've actually got a chamfer around the entire base of both parts. And that's, that helps us deal with the elephant foot effect. When the first layer is too close to the bed and subsequent layers squish out a little bit in the X and Y direction, and that can ruin print accuracy. So by doing this with a just a one millimeter chamfer, it actually lets us kind of mitigate it being too much of an issue. And that means that this internal bore won't be compromised by a layer that's a little bit too close because it'll take up that excess. And that's it. So I'm gonna say this as two separate STLs by right click, save as mesh, one file per body, and chuck it into Prusa Slicer. All righty, here are in Prusa Slicer, and I'm gonna prepare this file for printing. So I want it to be strong. And to do that, I'm gonna increase its perimeters because more perimeters equals more strength. It's like a thicker skin for the model, less infill, more material use, but a stronger part. And because this is quite chunky, there's not really much detail that needs to be involved. I'm gonna print it at my 0.3 millimeter thick, safer setting, which essentially is just slicing at 0.3 millimeter layers. So quite coarse, but it's perfectly fine for practical prints like this that we need to be strong. So you notice instantly it's at the wrong orientation. So I'm just gonna put this on the bed like that and this one on the bed as well, making sure that I have it in the right orientation. And this is the way I want it to be. Looks good. And then auto replace like that. In terms of slicer settings, we've got a 0.3 millimeter layer height with a first layer height of 0.2, a little bit snugger on the print bed. Perimeters, we're gonna bump that up to six. No worries, top and bottom layers, that's fine, it's three. And then in terms of the skirt and brim, I've got no brim, but I do have a skirt to start the nozzle printing, so it primes the nozzle, makes it ready for printing. And support material, we will need support material for that little tab that's hovering in space. I chose to put it there because I wanted uniform clamping pressure. But I'm totally okay with that because we've come a long way with support material and it's easy enough to remove. So I've got the overhang threshold of 20 and I might make that, let's make that 30. It is just pretty much just a flat shelf. And I'm gonna tick support on build plate only because I only want it on that tab. So let's slice this and see how it looks. Perfect, so it looks pretty good to me. Let's scroll through the layers and you can see that it's pretty much solid all the way through. There's a tiny amount of infill, but it's pretty much just solid perimeters all the way up. And you can see the most important details like this bolt hole, it forms and then it comes back and forms cleanly, slowly, and then comes up like so. And to print the other side, all you need to do is mirror the parts and then print them separately. So let's send this to the printer, get it assembled and make some music.